The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Welcome to the All Hazard Consortium's webinar entitled Understanding Mutual Assistance for Investor-Owned Utilities. I'm Laura Johnson. I'm the Manager of Meetings and Events for the All Hazards Consortium. We're a nonprofit association focused on homeland security and emergency management issues and guided by the Mid-Atlantic region. I'll be administering today's webinar, um, but before we begin, I'd like to provide a couple housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's event. Uh, first, this webinar will be recorded for use by the consortium. Uh, after its conclusion, everyone will receive a link to the webinar as well as a PDF copy of the PowerPoint slides. If you only dialed on to the audio portion of the webinar, you will be in listen-only mode. And if you logged on to the GoToWebinar platform and dialed in with your PIN, your phone has been muted upon entry. We'll, we will reserve time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. And there are two ways to participate in Q&A um, during this part, which is to simply raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon in the window panel that appears on your screen. And we will unmute your phone. Or the easiest way is to send questions to our webinar staff through the questions panel. You just type in your question and click send. And we're going to get things kicked off. Uh, I have the honor of introducing Tom Moran, who is the executive director of the All Hazards Consortium. Tom? Hi, thank you, Laura. <clears throat> Let me welcome everyone to, uh, to this webinar. Just as a little background, uh, in December of 2011, uh, many of the private sector operators, of, especially in the power sector, had approached DHS around uh, the topic of multi-state fleet movement. And they wanted to really, uh, following Irene, Hurricane Irene. And so um, DHS contacted the consortium who then, if you will, reached out to two states, New Jersey and Pennsylvania, to begin exploring how can we expedite some of the issues facing the electric sector and other utilities and supply chain movement. Uh, and uh, a meeting was held in Philadelphia, uh, and DHS was part of that. A number of companies were part of that from about eight different sectors. We had regulators there. And that started this, this, this discussion rolling around how do we expedite some of these processes to restore power and critical infrastructure. So over the course of the next year, this group stayed together and was working on some requirements and documents that would help uh, address this issue. And then Hurricane Sandy hit in late 2012. It was following Hurricane Sandy that the private sector decided to formally organize a working group um, to work with the states on this. And the name of that working group is now called the Multi-State Fleet Response Working Group. It is run by a steering committee of, of uh, operators in the private sector with a couple of states and is really focused on how do we expedite the movement of private sector resources across state lines, not just in the electric sector, but food and water and medical and telecom and uh, other supply chains and resources and finance and banking. And one of the things that came out of this, these, these series of meetings was we, we, we really want to try to educate both public and private sector as to the electric sector nuances of mutual aid how that works, how they share information and resources, why trucks have to leave my state in order to fix stuff in other states and the next storm it is the other way around. It's a fascinating process that's been out there. So we started a series of three webinars. One will focus on mutual aid. The second one will focus on the power, the power grid, how it works. And the third one will focus on a case study of one of the utilities that actually experienced Hurricane Sandy and all the things they had to go through to respond to that. So our speaker today is Mr. Jim Nowak. Jim is on the executive steering committee for the Fleet Working Group. He's been around the sector for a long time. He's the manager of emergency restoration planning at American Electric Power. Uh, they are an organization that serves 11 states and seven different operating companies covering from the Great Lakes down to the Gulf of Mexico. So I want to thank everyone for attending today. Jim, I want to thank you for preparing and, and, uh, and conducting this webinar for us. And we look forward to, uh, to hearing your presentation and some of the dialogue that will come afterwards. So with that, let me introduce Mr. Jim Nowak. Jim? Thank you, Tom. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to the group and represent the electric industry and talk about how investor-owned utilities provide mutual assistance to other members across the United States. Before I start, a little bit on myself, I've been in the 
electric industry for over 35 years. I've held various jobs through that my career, all of them with American Electric Power. It started off with an, in the engineering organization, and moved over into the records and budgeting, and then over into the operations group. Probably for the majority of my career, 20-some years, I've spent in the operations portion. And for the last 10 years, I've represented AEP as their coordinator for emergency management for our distribution organization. Uh, this involvement has uh, helped me meet with many utilities across the United States. AEP is represented in four regional mutual assistance groups. And with that, uh, have had a great opportunity to learn from others. And uh, hopefully, I can bring some of their uh, experiences, the things that they have done that have worked well uh, to this call. And, and we can have a productive and uh, good webinar and look forward to some questions at the end. With that, if we can go on to the next slide. What I'll be talking about today is really what do we do during mutual assistance in investor-owned utility? Why do we have a regional approach? What are the regional mutual assistance groups? I'm sure I've, a lot of you have been thinking after I said regional mutual assistance groups, well, what are they, who are they, and we'll get into that. And how do they prepare for an event? And then how do they share resources? If you look at the little the picture there, you'll see that there's a tremendous amount of ice in that conductor, approximately three inches of ice. Though the, the slide here depicts an ice event, we really use this mutual assistance process for all types of events, ice, snow, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes. And more recently, uh, the word deratio has come around. and uh, We've experienced a couple of deratios, and so we've even used it during the deratio. Moving on to the next slide. So why are we doing a regional approach? Well, if we uh, didn't have a regional approach, and we just allowed everybody to do the fastest finger, as I call it, then we'll have one utility call another utility, or one utility call the contractors, and they may have some of these members passing by each other and not actually working efficiently together as an organization. So a long time ago, we decided that the, using the fastest finger really isn't the approach. We really need to look at this as a regional event and how we can respond regionally. So what we did was we uh, put together a cooperative regional approach. And really, this approach has helped us over the last 60 years. But what we always do focus on, one of the main things that we must do is always be safe. So what we do is we concentrate on the safety of our employees, as well as all those employees that are helping us, and the public. So safety is, excuse me, safety is always our first and number one. The regional mutual assistance groups, or RMAGs as we refer to them, have been around for a long time. The oldest the Southeastern Electric Exchange is actually a trade organization that has a section of that organization that helps its members prepare and respond and do follow-up to large events. The newest of the RMAGs across the United States is the Northeast Mutual Assistance Group, or the NEMAG, as they refer to it. As you can see in the background, there's some kind of colored states, and we'll get into a little more detail. But this process has been tested year after year. And if we do it with even the most smallest events where a member cannot safely and efficiently restore power to its customers. So what happens is we reach out. So even from the smallest event, which could be a thunderstorm or a windstorm, to even the largest events, we all remember the 2004 hurricane season that hit Florida followed up in 2005 with Katrina, Wilma, and Rita. And then more recently, we've had Sandy and Isaac. And these events have really caused or helped us as we continue to work as a group 
to improve and understand how we can help each other. Uh, we've also done this for tornadoes, ice, and snow events. These regional mutual assistance groups, uh, at minimum, meet annually. And during those conversations and those meetings, they talk about lessons learned, previous events, and we start benchmarking each other so we can improve and get better as a group. The one thing that this group does is it's really its willingness to help each other. And, and these groups, they do it, and it's at a not-for-profit. When they release company resources, it's not to make money. It's to just bring resources of whatever are needed to help someone that's in need, whether it be lime, tree, assessment resources. It's voluntary. We do not have contracts. We do have an agreement that helps us follow in processes that allow us to help each other, knowing what to expect, what not to expect. But it also provides a rapid response. And then in addition to being rapid, it allows us to be scalable. It allows us to provide labor, equipment, and material. During the recent event of Sandy, there was material requests that were utilized between regional mutual assistance groups. There was requests for some logistics resources, as well as some of the office supports. And all those were shared across the members across the RMAGs and across the United States. So you, you want to know what, what are the actual RMAGs? If you look at the next slide, we have a picture of the United States, and we talk about the different RMAGs. Uh, recognized by the EEI, there are nine regional mutual assistance groups. And the EEI is the Edison Electrical Institute. Yeah, if I go over them fairly quick, we have the SEE, which is the Southeastern Electric Exchange. We have the Great Lakes Mutual Assistance Group up in blue. We have the Mid-Atlantic Mutual Assistance. We have um, the Midwest Mutual Assistance. Up in the top right, I show the New York Mutual Assistance, and I have the Northeast Mutual Assistance Group. They were separate organizations or groups, but recently they've uh, discussed merging together, and uh, that should uh, probably happen here in the next uh, month or so. They've also talking with the Mid-Atlantic Mutual Assistance Group and looking at should they join with them. And, and you may ask why they are grouping together. If you look at the geographical area that they cover, it's not quite as much as some of the other areas. And by maybe uh, being a little bigger in size, there's an opportunity for them to be a little more efficient. So th that discussion is going on. What I do want to note is that there's an overlap on all these uh, members. When you look at the SEE, which is in, down in the bottom right and it's orange, they actually cover more states than that. But there's an overlap. So they go up into the Virginia, West Virginia, and actually up into Ohio and Pennsylvania. But for this depiction here, we didn't have the ability or to multicolor them. So I'm just showing their general areas that they cover, but they do overlap. Um, also, and that's shown here, is the fact that they have uh, members that are in Canada as well as in Hawaii. I do want to make sure that I note that in, even with that overlap, there are members that are in multiple regional mutual assistance groups. Uh, an example is Duke Energy. Duke Energy is in the Southeastern Electric Exchange as well as in the Great Lakes Mutual Assistance and the Midwest Mutual Assistance. As I mentioned earlier, AEP is in the uh, four different regional mutual assistance groups the Southeastern Electric Exchange, the Texas Mutual Assistance, the Midwest, and the Great Lakes. So how are all these groups organized? Uh, over the years, the Edison Electrical Institute has helped these groups communicate and share best practices at the highest level. 
So what happens is that annually all the members are invited to meet at a EEI mutual assistance conference. When those members get together, they, they discuss some of the best practices, some of the changes in the industry, what uh, they're doing uh, with technology. And this isn't just to the members. It's open to some of our contra all our contractors so that they can come and they can participate in it and help us develop and become better. We also have a committee that's included in that group, and that executive committee consists of two representatives from each of those RMAGs, so it's a primary and secondary, as well as there's four officers. There's two co-chairs, vice chair, and secretary. And this committee holds calls quarterly and a lot of times on a monthly basis during specific issues. Okay, moving to the next slide, we have the member companies and their preparation. So how do, how do these companies prepare during what we call the blue sky? In the blue sky, there's typically no events going on. So instead of just sitting waiting for an event to happen, these member companies, they look at their resources and they start to develop list and make sure that they have identified all the different types of manpower and equipment that they can possibly release to help a sister company or another member in one of the regional mutual assistance groups. The types of resources, and this doesn't include them all, but they look at their distribution line and transmission line resources, the company resources. They look at contractors, both transmission and distribution line. The contractors play a very important role in mutual assistance. The contractors make up during a very significant event 50, sometimes even 60 percent of the total workforce. And so the contractors we work hand in hand and partner with to provide the best, safest, and most efficient restoration processes possible. We also release assessment groups. These assessors are uh, technicians that are trained to go and look at the damaged facilities, give an estimate of what is needed to repair it, bring that information back so that uh, material can be made up, issued to a line crew, my crew can go out and make repairs. Also have contract tree crews. We have supply chain, our stores attendants, we have station and relay technicians to help make sure that we get the stations back up, as well as safety individuals. Equipment, we look at all different types of equipment. We have bucket trucks, our digger derrick trucks, and we talk about what's the ratio of bucket trucks that we can release versus digger derricks. Some storms are more uh, wire-oriented versus pole. So the use of bucket trucks is more requested than it is for the digger there. Also, in addition to that, there's pole trailers to help haul the poles. There's yard dogs and swamp equipment. But as far as a strategy, you know, we, we develop our strategy during those blue sky events. We're looking to see how can we best move resources from one place to another. We develop processes for obtaining Department of Transportation permits. As Tom mentioned, there are organizations, the All Hazard Consortium is looking at how we can safely and efficiently move resources across multiple states. So we're always looking at what can we do to get better. We talk about the safety of our crews, how we can move them efficiently from one location to another. Uh, we, when we're bringing crews across a non-affected member and a truck breaks down, we many times call that non-affected member and say, truck's down, can you help us? And they'll send garage mechanics out to help us get that truck back up, fix a flat tire or whatever, to move it on so that we can continue with our restoration. The last thing we have is the education of the employees. So, you know, we've got to help them understand the expectations of mutual assistance. 
You've got to let them know that they're going to be working in some hard conditions. They're going to be working long hours. But the most important thing is their safety, safety of their fellow workers as well as the public. We've got to make sure that they understand there may be occasions where they may be sleeping in their vehicles briefly until we can set up the proper staging areas with lodging or until we can get electricity to a hotel. And of course, we want to make sure they understand that uh, once this is all done, to stay focused because they got a lot of them have to travel for a day or more back home. We want them to continue to be focused until they return home. And then last thing we do is we, we monitor the weather across the United States. And a lot of companies do that in different ways. Some have uh, uh, contracts with weather companies that will provide them alerts based on potential icing, wind, hurricane. Others have meteorologists on their property. Others rely on going to the web.com weather sites and book weather uh, forecasts and working from there. On the next slide, we talk about the pre-impact. So in a pre-impact, in a lot of cases, especially in a hurricane or potentially in an ice event, there's a great opportunity to know when an event is at least going to materialize. You may not have the exact strength of the event. You may not have the exact uh, landfall point, but you've got an idea. There's a hurricane coming, and it's going to be going along the East Coast. It has the potential to make landfall anywhere from Virginia up to New Jersey. So you start looking at and pre-staging and looking at the available resources. This is done through what we, we call conference calls. What we do is we'll, we'll set up a conference call, and I'll get into more detail on what's included in those conference calls later. What they'll do is they'll look at trying to determine what is the path, what's the estimated damage, can you predict the impact, the percent and degree of system loss, storm timing. And during those calls, a lot of the different members will bring their um, forecasts from their meteorologist or their weather company, and they'll compare them. And we'll look at how can we best provide the resources pre-staging so that we can be prepared to respond safely and efficiently. When we pre-stage, we do want the safety of the employees to uh, be one of our top concerns. And so we will stage them out of harm's way. So if a hurricane is anticipated to hit into an area, we won't be staging those people in that particular area. We may be staging them a half a day out. If it's moving north, we may stage them to the south, different locations, so that once the event goes through, they can come up and they can respond uh, quickly and safely. We also uh, look at how we allocate the resources. You know, who should be getting the resources? How many should they get? And when should they be moving? And what would be the arrival? So that's in our mobilization. So are we ready to send them today? Or do we have them leave tomorrow or the day after based on the anticipated landfall or the scheduling of when they need to cruise in from uh, uh, material staging as well as hotel lodging, et cetera. In the next slide, though, we're talking about what happens during the impact. Now, in the impact, if you look at this picture here, there's a tremendous impact, and I believe this is what happened after Katrina, just a devastating event. So in a lot of cases, you'll know that the impact has a uh, that the impact is going to occur because you have a good idea that the hurricane is coming. But there are those situations where you really don't know that the event is going to hit. It could be an earthquake. It could be a, a derecho where the wind picks up. So underneath these bullet items, I, we have some bullet items under impact. We have them under the track established as well as mobilization. Now under the impact, we talk about conference calls. And as I mentioned, we would kind of get a little more detail on conference calls. Just as an example, uh, we do get a lot of practice, unfortunately, performing these conference calls. 
For the Great Lakes Mutual Assistance Group, over the last three years, they've had 73 calls, while the Southeastern Electric Exchange had 70 calls. These calls, they can happen at any time of day or night. We, at minimum, will give the members one hour to come prepared with the resources you can release. But uh, we do try to give them two hours or more. But if we have to, we'll, we'll get everybody together within an hour. During those uh, calls, there's a lot of things that go on, and we do it in a very efficient manner. We get all the groups together. We do roll call. We talk about the weather conditions. We do a system update. What's the peak number of customers out that you had? What's your present number? What's your estimated time of restoration, if you had it? What's your request for resources? What are the conditions? How many broken poles, wires down? And then we talk about those that are not affected. What is the resource availability? What, what resources can you offer? How many? When can they be released? And what do you think the arrival time? We also talk about the contractors and the release of contractors, providing information to each other on the, the contacts, the names, and the company, and your requirements to release contractors. All this happens typically in a half an hour to 45 minutes. Right near the end of the call, we talk about the regulatory, if there's any media issues, and then we go into an allocation of resources. And then right before that allocation, we select the time for the next call if necessary. So how do we do the allocation of resources? The affected members that are involved will stay on the call. All of the companies that are releasing resources can stay on if they want. But what happens is after the call, there'll be communications that will go out to all the members telling them where the resources are going. The affected mem members will discuss the total resources, where they're being released from. They'll look at their total damage requests as well as the requests of others. And between those affected uh, members, they'll allocate all the line resources, the tree assessment, and uh, any type of material needs, et cetera. They'll discuss road closures. They'll talk about staging sites. And by the end of that allocation call, which is typically another 15 minutes to a half an hour, all the available resources that were offered were allocated. In many situations, that's, that's never enough, and you need to expand your request to a neighboring region. Uh, regional mutual assistance group, but uh, each regional mutual assistance group pretty much performs the same way, coming to the table with the availability when they can release them and offer them to the affected regional mutual assistance group, and then they allocate them on a very similar process. Uh, one thing I wanted to note was there's a lot of times where some of the companies, and I'll give an example of AEP, where we may be needing resources in our Oklahoma area. While we're looking to get resources, instead of moving a resource from our Indiana area, which would be a day to a day and a half away, we may hold the Indiana group and look to our neighbors in Texas, Louisiana, Missouri, so that they can be closer, come and provide assistance. And at the same time then, if someone closer to Indiana needs assistance, we'll release our Indiana resources to go maybe into Michigan, Illinois, Iowa to help with restoration efforts. This helps avoid those what I'll call ships passing through the night so that we're not being inefficient and we're approaching the restoration at a national level very efficiently or as efficient as possible. Also, uh, when uh, we're releasing resources, we do discuss the redeployment of resources, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I do want to note that when we do release resources, sometimes they're being released after you've performed 
a significant part of your restoration, but not all your customers are restored. And, and the reason for doing that is if you have a, a small area that still needs to be restored and you have more resources than you can safely and efficiently put into that area, then there can be a need to release some of the additional resources that you acquired so that you're not, uh, I shouldn't say standing around, but they're being less efficient at the staging sites and uh, it creates concerns of how safe and efficient they can be and releasing to somebody else who's maybe looking for additional resources or maybe picked up some additional outages because of an event that may have worked through uh, that evening. So moving to the next slide, at a high level, talk about the events. We have a, a level one, which is basically the local areas. And this is when you can pretty much handle it within your own company or maybe your sister company and possibly maybe one neighboring utility. Kind of a, a what I'll say, a, a small event. Then the level two is where it's more, you get the regional mutual assistance involved as far as an RMAG. And what happens is you activate a call, <coughs> excuse me, and you bring resources from that RMAG to the affected uh, member. And it's typically when it's only one member, maybe at best sometimes two. Then when you move into the level three, that's when you need to actually have resources come from more than one RMAG. And then finally you have the level four, which is something that's been just recently labeled and it's a national response event. The first three levels there, those have been processes that have been going on for years. The fourth level, we've been doing that in an informal way. And since Sandy and with the um, actual Irene, we put a little more thought into how we can improve our process nationally. And through a recent study, where a task force team from the EEI CEOs, they've come up with a national response event. And this is basically a significant event uh, that affects a lot of people and requiring resources from pretty much all the regional mutual assistance groups. Sandy would be a good example of, a, of what we would call a level four. Katrina would probably have been a level four had we had that, that title back in 2005. Moving on to the next slide, we'll talk about logistics. And one of the areas talking about logistics is food. <laughs> uh, when you bring in thousands of resources, it, it's really important that you have the ability to feed them. I, I'm not sure who quoted or who said the, the phrase where an army uh, lives off the food or lives off being uh, full belly. We can't uh, be sending line mechanics, assessors, tree trimming resources out in the field without making sure that they've uh, eaten, have sufficient energy, and can work through the day. The so food has become a, an important part. Prior to Katrina, the number of logistic food companies that were out there was just a handful. But the industry has seen the need to really step up and have more opportunity with different vendors. So there's been significant increase in the number of vendors that will come in and provide catering for your members. And some of the smaller ones, they can supply breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 500 to maybe 1,000 people daily, where some of the larger companies can feed up to 10,000 people daily. What the members have done is they've established some contracts with these logistics food providers, making sure that they're uh, available and uh, got a set price so they can bring them in, look at the staging sites so they know where they're going and build a relationship. Some of the things that they can offer, besides breakfast, box lunches, and dinners, they provide uh, rehydration drinks, bottled waters, snacks, ice, ice storage, refrigeration. A lot of the things that will help uh, provide some of the comfort foods as well as the main meals during the course of the day. 
continuing in logistics, we have lodging. In the next slide, we talk about the different types of lodging. The preferred lodging that uh, uh, most everyone would want to have if they can't live, work out of their home would be a hotel. But as we all know that when an event hits, there's a lot of people looking for hotels, and a lot of the hotels can be out of power. So if we can, if we can acquire hotels, we will do that. But we also do work uh, in uh, partnership with the community, and we do try to make sure that if there's activity going on and additional hotel rooms are needed, we'll, we'll see how we can best work with the communities, the local officials, realizing that FEMA, uh, they come in and they have the uh, ability to get the hotel rooms and use them for their restoration efforts for the humanitarian portion of that uh, restoration, of that uh, event. What after the hotels, we look at the bunk trailers. And the bunk trailers are, are really their, uh, the trailer part of a tractor trailer, and they actually can sleep as little as 12 employees, but up to 42 employees. The ones that serve the smaller amounts have restrooms, and showers located inside there. The bigger ones that hold 42 or so, they actually uh, don't have any of the showers or restrooms, and those come in separately. And uh, they are also in trailers that will be located in the staging site. Then the other options are large halls, fairgrounds, civic centers. Uh, we do have a lot of the logistics providers that can provide the cots and bedding for 10 to 15,000 uh, cots and large halls, and we can put them in gymnasiums, et cetera. Uh, the difficulty is, is putting 500 people in a gymnasium floor, the quality of sleep does sometimes uh, get deteriorated, and it, uh, we're hoping to get the best uh, rest for the employees during the course of the night. And then, of course, we can always do tents. And the tents, as you can see, they can sleep 200 to 1,000 employees. These tents can be heated. They can be cooled. And uh, they're, they're one of the things about tents and the bunk trailers. Once you activate them, the bunk trailers can be put up at a staging site in roughly 24 hours, tents about 40 hours. So 40 hours once they're on the property having a full function tent with catering as well as lodging, allowing your employees to come in and get away from the event at the end of the day, get some food, and get a fairly good night's sleep. Then in the next slide we talk about staging sites. Uh, it's, it's necessary for us to make sure that we have staging sites identified ahead of time. A lot of the vendors that we work with will come in and they will map out how to lay out the staging site. Where is your catering tent? Where do we put the bunk trailers, the fuel? A lot of the things that these staging site vendors or logistics vendors have, they'll have site managers. They'll provide security, parking control lighting, first aid station, generators, forklift to move material around if you make it a material site also, the showers, the restrooms, the hand wash, trash can, they'll do laundry on site. If there's no way of uh, removing gray water, they'll bring tanks in to capture the gray water. Plus they'll have uh, supporting vehicles to transport the employees. A lot of times you may have a staging site that doesn't have tents for cots or bunk trailers because you have some hotels acquired. We'll move to the hotel, so we'll transport them through buses to the hotel. Moving on to the next slide, and we're getting near the end of the presentation, talk about the redeployment. And I did briefly hit on this earlier, but when we talk about redeployment, talking about what do you do with the resources once you're done with them? Well, we want to make sure that when we're done with the resources, that if they're needed somewhere else, they go where they're needed. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll hold conference calls. 
very similar to the other conference calls, discuss the resources that become available. Is there a need out there? What type of resources? We talk about how long they've been working to make sure that if they do go somewhere, they can put in the proper amount of time. Typically, we will try to work our company resources around two weeks, but uh, typically between 10 days and two weeks, and then we'll change them out. Even the changing out of employees isn't a simple process. If we have to change out employees that have traveled for two days, is it efficient to drive their vehicles back two days? And then what will happen is you can't really bring them back and have the other employees leaving at the same time because then you'll have a significant amount of resources off your property. So what we'll do is we'll look at finding the employees down in one day and then pick up the other employees and bring them back. For those that are located closer within a day or so, they will travel in and the other resources will, will travel back. Excuse me. Um, also, when we look at moving resources, once the requesting utility determines what resources they're going to get, they work on all the agreements as far as if there's contractors, they'll uh, get the info contact information and then they'll communicate with them and determine where the resources are going, when they're going to be released, and give them a point of contact. Going to the, the final slide, which base is the summary, just wanted to note that over the years, we've really had the need to move resources, not only within our mags, regional mutual assistance groups, but to neighboring our mags and across the U.S. During Sandy, I don't think there was a state that didn't offer or move resources. And it's necessary that this remain a critical part of any utilities restoration effort. And all utilities have really brought this up and are looking at how they can improve, become more efficient. But as we will require, we'll continue to uh, improve with these regional mutual assistance groups. We'll continue to do our pre-planning, making sure that we're as safe and efficient as possible. Uh, with that, I've uh, probably got to a point where I could turn it over and uh, see if there's any questions, and then we can wrap it up. So uh, I think, Laura, I'm turning it over to you. Yeah, Jim, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, first, who initiates and facilitates the mutual assistance conference calls? Good, good question. The member inside a regional mutual assistance group the affected member requests the call. So they're the ones who initiates it. A lot of these RMAGs, I think just about every one of them now, have a point of contact that they will, they will notify, and then an email, a phone blast will go out to all members saying that we have established this call. Please come prepared. We, we, we try not to have the person who is affected really run the call. And, and for the most part, that doesn't happen because that person is trying to take notes and organize their thoughts. So we typically have a volunteer. So there's not a set person who will run the call. It could vary, but it's almost, with almost in all cases, not any of the affected members. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Uh, please explain what the arrangement is in the REMAG for consumable supplies like poles. Is it the responsibility of the impacted area company to get them from the pole vendors, or do they get them from the mutual aid company and then pay them back? Who pays who, and how does it work? In in most situations, the pole vendor. I'm sorry, the affected member will contact their poll provider, and the poll providers have had a pretty good history of being able to supply all the polls required. However, if a, and, and they are responsible for the cost of those polls. However, if a affected member cannot get the necessary equipment from the vendors that they deal with, 
they will reach out to other members and they will pay the cost that the member that is offering the material or equipment has paid for. So if if some comp if AEP is looking for poles and I reach out to Oklahoma Gas and Electric and they give me ten poles, it's exactly what's on the books for those ten poles is what I will I will reimburse them for. It's it's a not for profit. Thanks, Jim. Uh, another comment here. All this is fine for CONUS. How is this done for the non-contiguous U.S., like Hawaii and Alaska? Um, that, that's a very good question, and I guess I'll, I'll knock on wood. We've not had a request from Alaska or Hawaii to send resources that I am aware of. Uh, the Western RMAG has both of those members in their group, and I would have to follow up with that, and I will gladly do that if need be. But I can't. I'm not sure they've ever asked, but if needed, we would do our best to try to figure out how to get there and help them do a safe and efficient restoration. Sounds good, Jim. If, if our mag services are delivered at a not-for-profit basis, how are costs covered? Uh, no services from an our mag is delivered to another our mag for profit. However, when we release contract crews, those contract crews are they will de develop a contract with the company they're going to help. So, if AEP releases company resources, it's always not for profit. There's, there's that's our agreement. If I release contractors and they go to help some utility on the East Coast, once I release those contractors, we'll provide contact information. We'll leave it up to the contractor and the requesting utility on the East Coast to determine what type of pricing contract uh, arrangements that are, are necessary for them to give them uh, assistance in their restoration. Another question here, wondering how this effort fits into the response to recovery and business continuity for utilities who are themselves affected by a wide-scale outage. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Wondering how this effort fits into the response to recovery and business continuity for utilities who are themselves affected by a wide-scale outage. Um. I guess I'm, I'm not sure I'm completely understanding the question, and I apologize. I'm, I am on a cell phone, and to me, it's, it's a little staticky, so I apologize. Well, that's but okay. I'm not clear on the question either, but we can solve with that individual um, separately. So let me move on to the next question. Um, are there any provisions that utility companies make for the families of crew members who are deployed during their absence? Um, there are. Some utilities, mostly along the Gulf Coast and the East Coast, will provide family assistance for the families in the homes of a, that can be affected to a hurricane. So if the employee is has a home on the coast and a hurricane comes in, and their home is damaged or the, the family can't come back into the home, they will work with trying to provide some type of temporary, uh, uh, I guess, construction, tarping to avoid future or further damage uh, so that the employee at least has a safety of uh, mind that his home is and his family is safe. But as far as employees that are coming from another location that come on our property to assist, there is nothing on uh, for them when they leave their families for a couple weeks to, to assist. So a lot of utilities will help their employees and do what they can, and that's not common across the mall. It depends on the location. But as far as for resources coming in from somewhere else, uh, there's nothing that I know of. 
another question here. How is situational awareness handled between RMAGs and state and local EOCs? What communication tools are used? The, uh, the communication tools that are, are used is each individual member has developed internally their process and, and they are responsible for communicating to their local state organization. There is the regional mutual assistance groups do not uh, provide nor do they want to provide the communication that is done locally. That each utility for the most part has their corporate communications group. They'll work with the local media, the emergency management groups. In addition, there's a lot of emergency management groups that request a company employee either be a point of contact or located at one of the EOCs. So it varies across every city. Each state runs differently, and there is no no consistent process across the United States, but it is handled at the member level. Now, at the federal level, we do look to the EEI to keep update at a national level the activities that are going on at the different regional mutual assistance groups. They do not go into the individual members, but they will respond by state where resources are moving. And they do that in conjunction with the Department of Energy because the Department of Energy gets uh, reports during from affected members when they reach a certain criteria of number of customers out in duration. So nationally to the federal organization, it's handled uh, by EEI, Edison Electrical Institute, and the Department of Energy. At the state and local levels, that's done by the individual members, and it varies across the different locations based on local practices. Okay, um, we have a, an audio question from John um, Bocino. Um, John, can you go ahead and speak and see if we have your audio? Oh, actually, uh, my question was just asked and answered. I appreciate it. Thank <laughs> okay. You. I don't thank know you. how I got unmuted, though. That's okay, thank button. you. Thank All you. Right. Bye. Okay, great. Um, another caller, Jim, comments, uh, I know that Cal EMA has developed a resource typing document for equipment, such as FEMA has for many resource types. Does EEI have such a document as well? And also, has anyone attempted resourcing team types based on capability and makeup? Uh, at this time, there has been discussion on it, and we're, we're looking at all different potentials. But right now, there is no resource typing across the uh, industry as far as crew typing or equipment typing. But it has been discussed. But uh, other than that, I I know of nothing that's any, any anything concrete after that. Um, how is this process applied when U.S. utilities need assistance from Canada? Are resources ever pulled in from Mexico? Uh, resources from Canada have been pulled in many times, especially uh, well, I've used them in Ohio. But I know they have been down numerous times along the northeast area. There are some uh, restrictions and requirements for border crossing, as we all know, coming from one country to another. And uh, there's been a lot of effort done for that. Um, I know there's uh, a gentleman, John Shainer, who has uh, worked hard. And, and there is, a, a, I believe, a document that is now close to being completed on how we can efficiently move resources across from Canada. As far as from uh, Mexico, um, I am not aware of resources that have ever come across from Mexico to help in any mutual assistance. And um, from my limited exposure in Texas, we have
have not sent any resources into Mexico, but I know that there have been some resources gone to other countries, islands, etc. But I, if I would start to try to go from memory, I wouldn't be very accurate on that. And we have an audio question from Pete Kirby. Pete? Hi, I wanted to ask uh, uh, whether the RMAGs have a hierarchy of leadership that serves to provide interaction with government agencies like the Department of Homeland Security's uh, infrastructure protection folks or to either the, the FEMA National Response Coordination Centers or the Regional Response Coordination Centers, or does that burden remain with the utility that's been most affected? Good, good question. And the uh, coordination with DOE, Homeland Security, FEMA, and those groups are coordinated or at a federal level are done in conjunction with the Edison Electrical Institute. They are um, working and have an oversight group that is being uh, developed to help improve that. That oversight group will have utility personnel in it. So um, like during Sandy, there was an EEI representative, which is a liaison back to all the regional mutual assistance groups, all the members. And that person would help carry our message to them and also bring that message back. So as far as a, how we work as a hierarchy, at a federal level, we utilize the EEI as our liaison. But also, I will say that at a uh, local level, many, many of the members will deal with their local FEMA, DHS, just like they would with emergency management. Uh, I know um, several times during past hurricanes, affected members would have uh, that state FEMA representative or regional representative working with them to uh, help you anything needed any assistance as possible. Hope that answers your question. It does, thanks. Um, there's another comment here, Jim, it, how it would be great to determine a national standard for us. Do you know if there's any effort in that area? A, a national standard for what? It, it just says, would be great to determine a national standard for us. I'm assuming they're talking about the mutual assistance um, aid. Okay. You know, if there's any to that end. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the national standard for requesting resources will be the, um, when it reaches a national response event, there is a allocation committee that will take the resources available and help with the, the allocation across all the members, affected members. So I think I've, I've answered the question. Okay, good. Um, and uh, one last question, Jim. Do you get resources from outside the, the RMAG? Yes, and, and I'm glad you, uh, you asked that. Uh, as I mentioned a little earlier, the contractors are a tremendous amount of resource. But in addition to the contractors, there are the co-ops and municipalities. And during a, a large event, we will reach out to our contractors, and they may be working for a co-op, they may be working for a municipality, they may be working for a refinery, or some may be in union halls that have just come off a job that was uh, uh, finished. Though we do reach out to all those groups, um, so. We do get that assistance um, as we move forward. Uh, each um, organization at the EEI level or at the federal or uh, national level are starting to work more and more together trying to make sure that we do this as safe and efficiently as possible. But we definitely get a tremendous amount of help uh, in addition to the great, great help we get in the investor-owned utilities from our contractors, co-ops, and unions. They, they 
they walk there with us. Okay, great. Thanks, Jim. I, and I wanted to remind our callers that uh, everyone will receive a link to today's webinar um, as well as a copy of the slides. Um, just give us a day or two to put that together for you. And on behalf of the All Hazards Consortium, I'd like to thank you, Jim, for speaking today and putting this information together for this group. We had um, over 150 callers, so you can see there's high interest in this topic. So thank you very much. Well, um, and I'd like to thank all of you for calling in for today's webinar. Um, I appreciate your time today, and this ends today's webinar. Thank you. Have a great day.